Well, hello again, here we are. Uh, numbers in Deuteronomy for beginners, uh, faithfulness in the face of challenge. This is lesson number four in our series. Uh, total series, 10 lessons. We're on lesson number four of the title of this lesson, Rebellion and Leadership. And if the Lord is willing, we'll cover uh, chapter 13 to 20. So the uh, material that we've looked at so far in chapters five to 12 were all about preparation. The uh, people had built the tabernacle complex and in the seven chapters uh, that we covered uh, previously, Moses provides the details concerning the preparations that were made for their journey. And these included rules to maintain ceremonial purity, a system to deal with crime, um, a manner to deal with the suspicion of marital infidelity, uh, the regulations for those who are uh, making a Nazarite vow, uh, consecration of the Levites into the service of the tabernacle, uh, the manner of divine guidance with the cloud and the pillar of fire, and finally the proper use of the silver trumpets in order to signal to the people various uh, events and uh, times. Um, after these preparations are made for their departure, two negative things uh, occur. First, the people complain about the lack of meat in their diet and God miraculously provides more than enough quail to uh, feed the entire group. However, in gorging themselves uh, with the meat, the people sin and God sends a plague to punish them. And once order is restored, then Miriam and Aaron, Moses' sister and brother, challenge Moses' authority and God affirms Moses' leadership and strikes Miriam with leprosy for her insubordination. Uh, we find out later on that she is banished from the camp for a week and after she uh, healed, she returns uh, and uh, thus the people are set to leave for their journey to the promised land. Now, I mentioned that the journey from where they were in uh, Sinai to the land of Canaan would take approximately a month to complete. However, we soon find out that there will be a crucial test of faith that the people fail, which will turn their month long sprint into a 40 year marathon of wandering in the wilderness. And so we begin with chapters 13 to 20 um, and uh, we'll talk about the general content of that material. Chapters 13 to 20 of the book of Numbers cover a significant period in the journey of the Israelites through the wilderness. These chapters detail pivotal events, their consequences, and their significance to the development of Israel as a nation under God's guidance. So let's begin, shall we, with chapter 13. Um, in chapter 13, uh, Numbers uh, 13, uh, verses 1 to 33, uh, in this section, Moses sends 12 spies, one from each tribe, to scout the land of Canaan. They return after 40 days with reports and samples of the uh, land's uh, produce. And you see in the map uh, before you um, the uh, extent of their journey. This is pretty much the, the, the various places that they went uh, in the land of Canaan uh, and returned uh, to report. Now, the significance of the report of the spies shapes the Israelites' response to God's promise. We read that 10 spies give a discouraging report, focusing on the challenges leading to fear and rebellion among the people, which signify a lack of faith in God's provision and protection. Two of the spies, however, Caleb and Joshua, encourage the people to trust in God and to, uh, to know that God will give them the victory despite the challenges mentioned uh, by the other 10 spies. Note that they didn't dispute that there would be difficulties and the enemy was formidable, but their point was that God would give them the victory if they would trust in him. This conflict sparked a rebellion, which is described in chapter 14. Chapter 14, verses one to 45, uh, we learn here that the people rebel, refusing to enter Canaan. 
and we see both Moses and Aaron, as well as Joshua and Caleb, cry out to God for help and plead with the people not to rebel against uh, God. It is at this point that God offers to destroy all of the people and start all over again with Moses and his descendants. Moses argues that other nations will dishonor God for not bringing the people to the promised land and this would be interpreted as a sign of weakness. That's his argument. The point here is not that God was talked out of something, but that Moses was being tested to see if he had the people's welfare at heart and the proper humility to lead a people who would prove to be hard uh, of heart and rebellious uh, by nature. So this was a test, as much a test for Moses as it was uh, for the people. At this point, God declares that none of this generation, except Caleb and Joshua, who brought back a positive report, none of the people will enter the promised land. All those that had been counted in the census that we talked about a few weeks ago, uh, would die in the desert. They are condemned to wander for 40 years, one year for each day that the spies spent spying out the land. This represents a pivotal moment of judgment and consequence for disobedience and lack of faith, and also emphasizes the serious repercussions of rebelling against God and not walking uh, by faith. And so we move on to chapter 15. In chapter 15, we go from the scene of rebellion and punishment to a listing of laws on offering and sacrifices. These include rules for unintentional sins, and there's even a description of a specific incident involving a man who was uh, gathering sticks on the Sabbath, who was uh, eventually uh, put to death. This uh, abrupt shift in topic from chapter 14 to chapter 15 can initially seem jarring, but it serves a specific literary and theological purpose within the structure of the text. And here's an explanation of this uh, transition. Uh, at one moment, God is uh, punishing the people with a terrible uh, punishment, and then the next moment, he's giving them instructions about specific offerings uh, in their religious exercises. So why do that? Well, first, uh, chapter 14, this chapter deals with the Israelites' rebellion following the uh, negative report by the 10 spies. The people refused to enter the promised land due to fear uh, of the inhabitants, leading to uh, God's decree that they will wander in the wilderness for 40 years, and that none of the current adult generation except Caleb and Joshua will enter the promised land. That's chapter 14. Chapter 15 shifts to detailing various laws and offerings related to when the Israelites will eventually settle in the promised land. These laws include offerings for unintentional sins, as well as regular burnt offerings, grain offerings, and drink offering. So why this shift? This is the, the point I'm making here. Why this, this unusual shift in uh, subject matter and tone? Well, first of all, uh, there's a theological reaffirmation that takes place here. After the despair and punishment described in chapter 14, Chapter 15 serves as a reaffirmation of the covenant between God and the Israelites. You see, despite the current generation's failure, God continues to prepare the future generation for life in the promised land. It underscores God's unchanging promise to the descendants of Abraham, Isaac, and Jacob. Yes, you failed miserably here, but in the future, here are some of the things you'll need to be doing when you eventually enter the promised land. Another reason, hope and continuity. By introducing laws relevant to life in Canaan, the text provides a message of hope and continuity. It, it reassures the Israelites that although they are currently wandering as a consequence of their disobedience, there is still a divine plan in place for them and they need to prepare for it by understanding the required observances and the rituals. Another reason, instructions, instructional purpose. The new laws in chapter 15 remind the Israelites and the reader of the importance of obedience to God's commandments. After witnessing the uh, devastating consequences of disobedience in chapter 14, these instructions in chapter 15 
served to guide the Israelites on how to live righteously and in alignment with God's will once they enter the promised land. Another reason, literary structure. From a literary perspective, the shift may also serve to transition the narrative from a historical account of events to the legal and ritual instructions necessary for forming a functional society once they enter Canaan, an idea that they had recently thought would be impossible. I mean, after their dis disobedience and the punishment, they're thinking, uh, we'll, never, uh, you know, we'll never reach the land of Canaan. But by giving them this information about what to do when they get to the land of Canaan, this reaffirms the promise of God that eventually they will enter. And so this structure mirrors other parts of the Pentateuch where uh, narrative and law interweave to teach through both story, which is narrative, and statute, which are laws and uh, ordinances. And then of course, uh, the abrupt change from chapter 14 to chapter 15 in the book of Numbers effectively bridges the narrative of punishment with a forward looking focus on preparation for their eventual entry into the promised land. In other words, it reinforces the ongoing relationship between God and the Israelites centered around the covenant, the promises that are made, obedience by the people, future hope, even in the face of current failures and challenges. The people might want to give up, but God does not give up or change his promises. As for the um, man uh, executed for breaking the Sabbath by collecting sticks, this event had a significant effect on the people as well, especially after their rebellion over the uh, spies uh, incident. This incident emphasized the importance of, of, of uh, observing the Sabbath, a commandment that held a central place in the Mosaic law. Now, the Sabbath was not only a day of rest, but it was also a sign of the covenant between God and Israel, symbolizing trust in God's provision and a break from daily labors to dedicate time to spiritual reflection and renewal. So by including a narrative or a story, if you wish, uh, about someone breaking the Sabbath, the text underscores the seriousness of this command, that this was a divine command that required compliance that disobedience threatened the cohesiveness of the community since this ordinance was also a vehicle to create unity and a particular identity among the Jewish people. You see, only the Jews had a Sabbath day. No other nation had this idea of a, of a day off in order to stop working. Uh, everyone stopped working. Slaves did not work. Women did not work. Men did not work. It was a day off a day to contemplate uh, spiritual matters. Only the Jews had this uh, particular ordinance. It separated them from the rest of the world. And it also established once again, Moses' role, not only in articulating the laws and the ordinances of God, but also as one who could enforce these laws. In the end, he was the one that gave the people the instruction to execute the offender according to the law. So Moses didn't only give the laws and explain the laws, but he also had the authority to enforce the laws. All right, we move on to chapter 16, another important event, Korah's uh, rebellion. In number 16, Korah, along with Dathan and Abiram, and 250 community leaders bring several charges against Moses and Aaron. These charges primarily focus on accusations of excessive authority and mismanagement of their leadership roles. So here's a list of the specific charges brought against Moses and Aaron by Korah and his followers. First of all, Korah accuses Moses and Aaron of taking too much upon themselves. He argues that the entire congregation is holy and that the Lord is among them all, questioning why Moses and Aaron exalt themselves above, above the assembly uh, of the Lord uh, in Numbers 16, verse three. Then uh, they're accused of elitism in their leadership. 
Implicit in Korah's accusation is the charge that Moses and Aaron have established a hierarchy that excludes others who are equally qualified, particularly from the perspective of Korah and the Levites who also had roles in the religious activities of the community. In other words, today we, we would say, who made you the boss? You know, who made you king? That, that, that was the argument that they were making. And then of course, they accused them of failing in their leadership. Even though they were leaders, they didn't do a good job. Although not directly stated, there's a, an underlying implication that Moses has failed to bring the people into the promised land. It was his fault. <laughs> the spies are the ones who lied, the people are the ones who rebelled, but in the end they blamed Moses uh, for not being able to go to the promised land uh, immediately. Uh, and in doing so, questioned his effectiveness and the legitimacy of his leadership. And so this, uh, this, is, uh, this reflects the, the broader context of dissatisfaction among the people regarding their situation and their uh, prospects. Uh, of course, uh, all of this is referenced in other rebellions and complaints throughout the book of Numbers. If it only happened once, it would be one thing, but we see this type of thing taking place over and over again in the book of Numbers. And so these charges express a broader challenge to the established divine order through Moses and Aaron. Korah's rebellion is significant as it not only questions human leadership, but also represents a direct challenge uh, to the structure and authority that has been ordained by God as Moses' leadership was divinely appointed. In other words, they weren't only challenging Moses, but they were also challenging God. Of course, Moses and God respond decisively to address the accusations and to restore order. And so here's a summary of their um, responses. First of all, there's an immediate challenge. Moses challenges Korah and his followers to attest to prove who is truly chosen by God. He tells them to take censers and to put fire and incense in them before the Lord the next day so that the Lord may show who is holy, who is his chosen one. Next, uh, they accuse uh, the rebels of uh, overreaching in other words, Moses accuses Korah and his followers, particularly the Levites, of not being content with their designated roles and seeking the priesthood, which was beyond what God had assigned to them. They had a very privileged position, but as is in human nature, it didn't seem to be enough. Then Moses attempts to speak with Dathan and Abiram, uh, two others who were in league with Korah and his accusations and they refused to come, accusing Moses of leading them away from a land flowing with milk and honey. And that wasn't Canaan. They're talking about Egypt. They're, they're complaining that uh, the wrong that Moses did was that he led them out of Egypt where they only remember the good times. Uh, and now they fear that they'll die in the wilderness, further questioning his uh, leadership. And then uh, uh, Moses, as he has done often before and will do again, goes into uh, intercessory uh, prayer for the people. After God tells Moses he's going to destroy the whole congregation, Moses and Aaron intercede for the people, arguing that only those who have sinned, the leaders of the rebellion, should be punished, not the entire community. And so in the following passages, we read of God's uh, response. Uh, first of all, uh, God makes a separation. God instructs the congregation to separate themselves from the households of Korah, Dathan, and Abiram. Next, God causes the earth to open up and swallow Korah, Dathan, Abiram, and their households along with all of their possessions and then close up again. Imagine the horror of seeing the earth open up, swallow all these people and their tents and possessions and animals, and then close up again, uh, signifying a direct divine intervention to affirm Moses' leadership and punish the rebels in a very public and horrific uh, manner. Then there's the further destruction of another 250 rebels. Fire comes forth from the Lord and consumes the 250 men who were offering incense 
which serves as a warning and a sign of divine authority and wrath against those who challenge God's appointed leadership. And then finally, a prevention of further rebellion. After the initial punishment, when the congregation murmurs against Moses and Aaron, blaming them for killing God's people, God sends a plague among the people. And so Moses and Aaron quickly make atonement for the people with Aaron standing between the living and the dead to stop the plague and thus preventing further loss of life. And so Moses and God's responses to Korah's rebellion are both immediate and severe, emphasizing the seriousness of the challenge to divinely ordained leadership and the sanctity of God's command regarding religious and communal roles. This incident highlights the consequences of usurping divine authority, and it also serves as a, a pivotal lesson on the importance of adhering to God's chosen leadership and structure within the Israelite community. Today, I think, uh, I, I sincerely believe that God is as zealous uh, for the way the church is organized, uh, for the way worship is organized, the way worship is uh, uh, offered uh, in this day and age. Uh, God still cares and zealously guards the way uh, that uh, we are to worship him in a, an acceptable fashion. And, and uh, the instructions that he gives us in the New Testament that we can follow in order to do that. And we've seen uh, you know, everywhere uh, how so many uh, individuals have taken it upon themselves uh, to change uh, the instructions that God has given and fashioned for themselves a manner of worship that's pleasing to them, but not necessarily pleasing to God. Anyways, we move on to uh, chapter 17. Uh, here the main event uh, is uh, an effort to end disputes over the priesthood. Uh, there were disputes over who should have the priesthood. And so staffs, from each tribe's leader are placed in the tabernacle. And we find out that Aaron's staff overnight, it buds, it blossoms, and it produces uh, almonds in a miraculous fashion. Therefore, the blossoming of Aaron's staff serves as a divine response to resolve the dispute over the priesthood that had been escalated by Korah's rebellion. This miraculous event was meant to clearly demonstrate God's choice and support for Aaron and his descendants as the rightful priests. Here are three specific purposes for why God chose Aaron's staff to bloom. First, it was an affirmation of divine selection. Uh, the blossoming of Aaron's staff among all the other staffs of the tribal leaders served to confirm and reaffirm Aaron and his family's divine selection for the priesthood. This event clearly illustrated God's choice, thereby setting any dis or settling rather any disputes or questions regarding the legitimacy of Aaron's priestly authority. Secondly, there was a restoration of order and peace. Uh, by providing a clear and unmistakable sign, God aimed to restore order and peace among the Israelites. Had he not done that, there would be continual battles, continual fights, continual division over this important issue. And so following the severe punishments meted out in response to Korah's rebellion, the blossoming staff helped to calm tensions and to reassure the people that the leadership structure established by God was to be maintained, thus preventing further rebellions and restoring stability within the community. Notice there were 250 uh, rebels, if you wish. Uh, this is out of uh, over a million people. So there was a very small number of rebels, but they were threatening to create a huge division uh, uh, among, the, uh, among the people of God. And then also the event served as a powerful visual reminder of God's active presence and power in the lives of the Israelites. Despite all of the disruptions, God was still in charge and he was still tending to his uh, people. So this brings us to chapter 18, where we talk about the duties and rights of priests and Levites. Now that the, 
the positions and who are to uh, function in these positions have been settled, uh, we begin now uh, to uh, have the responsibilities and privileges of the priest and the Levites, including the details on uh, the offering and the tithes. They have received instructions about their roles and duties in the past, but in chapter 18, God adds and emphasizes the following. First of all, a clarification of responsibilities and rights. Uh, while earlier chapters introduced various duties of the priests, Numbers chapter 18 specifically explains a comprehensive set of responsibilities. In other words, it outlines their duties related to the offerings, both the most holy offerings and the lesser holy offerings, and also their role in managing the sanctuary and the altar. Also, there's uh, instruction as to the specific rights to the offerings. This chapter specifies that priests are entitled to certain offerings not previously detailed with such clarity. These include the most holy parts of the offerings made by the Israelites, such as the meat from the sin and guilt offerings and all the dedicated gifts brought by the Israelites. In chapter 18, you get information about which portion the priests are allowed to keep. And then there's the question of tithes. A significant new detail is that the Levites receive a tenth of the Israelites' produce as a tithe. And then in turn, they are to give a tithe of that tithe to the priests. Uh, this specific tithe of the tithe is a detailed regulation of how the Levitical and priestly support structure is to be funded, which hasn't been explained or laid out before. In other words, the Levites were to receive uh, the tithe, 10% of, of the people's crops and cattle and so on and so forth. They would receive 10% of that and then they would then give 10% of what they had received to the priests in order to help support the priests on a daily and uh, monthly uh, uh, basis. And then there was also information about land inheritance. A, a notably new element in this chapter is the explicit statement that the Levites and the priests would have no inheritance of land in Israel. Instead, their inheritance would be the offerings of the Israelites made by fire to the Lord and the tithes. This reinforces their dependence on the community and their unique role uh, uh, within it. And then one other uh, important point in this chapter, and that is the redemption of the firstborn. While the concept of the firstborn belonging to God was introduced earlier, Numbers chapter 18 details the process by which firstborn sons and unclean animals are to be redeemed. The priests play a central role in this process, which underscores their duties in upholding the sanctity of the firstborn dedication to God. And so these regulations in Numbers 18 serve to strengthen the structure and the sanctity of the priesthood, clearly defining their role, their support, and the manner in which they are integrated into the religious and community life of Israel. So the chapter ensures that the minister's spiritual responsibilities are matched by provisions that sustain them materially, creating a balanced system of religious service and community support. And so in the chapter, the priests and the Levites know what their job is, what they are going to do, and the community knows what it needs to do in order to support them in their work. Brings us to chapter 19, very interesting um, matter here. Uh, chapter 19, one to 22, uh, we have the laws concerning the sacrifice of a red heifer and the use of its ashes to purify those who have come in contact with uh, death. The red heifer was unique as an animal for sacrifice. First of all, it's, uh, its color. Uh, the red heifer had to be completely red without two hairs of any other color. This uh, complete redness was unique among sacrificial animals, which typically did not have uh, color requirements. Also the heifer had to be without defect and never have been yoked or worked. 
And so the purity and lack of labor ensured that the animal was wholly dedicated to the ritual without ever having been used for any other purpose. This was the way of demonstrating its, uh, its unique uh, position. Um, another uh, another uh, piece of information was the, um, the uh, purpose of the sacrifice itself. The primary purpose of the red heifer sacrifice was for ritual purification, specifically to produce the ashes that were used in the water of cleansing. This was necessary for purifying people who had come in contact with a corpse, which rendered them ceremonially unclean. And so the ashes were mixed with water and used in a purification rite. We see that in chapter 19, verses nine to 13. In contrast, other sacrifices commonly described in earlier chapters, such as in Leviticus, were made for a variety of reasons including sin offerings, burnt offerings, peace offerings, guilt offerings. These were generally aimed at atonement for sins or expressing gratitude to God or the fulfillment of vows and they facilitated communion with God. So other animal sacrifices were used for a lot of different reasons. The red heifer sacrifice was used for only one thing. We also have information about the method of the sacrifice. The, uh, the red heifer was sacrificed outside of the camp, which was unusual because most sacrifices were made at the uh, tabernacle altar. The entire heifer, including its blood, hide, flesh, and dung, were burned to ashes in a ceremonial fashion. Typically, sacrifices involving other cattle were conducted at the altar that was located within the tabernacle or the uh, temple Parts of the animal were burnt on the altar, but certain parts like the hide and some of the flesh could be used by the priests or the one who was offering the sacrifice. More information. Uh, the red heifer had very specific requirements. It needed to be completely red without any blemish and it must never have borne a yoke. The rarity of such an animal added to the uniqueness and the sanctity of this sacrifice. While offerings like bulls and lambs also had requirements regarding being free of defects, there was no stipulation regarding their color or uh, previous yoke bearing as with the red heifer. It was a very, very uh, specific and unique animal and a very unique uh, sacrifice. And of course the sacrifice itself, the ashes of the red heifer were used for purification purposes marking this sacrifice as part of a continuing rite that could be used over time by mixing the ashes with water whenever it was needed. The effects of other sacrifices were generally immediate with the physical parts of the sacrifice consumed by fire at the time of offering and thus not used beyond the ritual sacrifice itself. In other words, you brought a guilt offering, uh, it was burned, it was used, your guilt offering was made and that was the end of it. The red heifer sacrifice, uh, all the ashes, it was burned to complete ash. Those ashes were collected. They weren't thrown away or buried. They were collected and kept and they were added to uh, water to uh, make a, a certain uh, drink and used uh, to uh, purify someone who had become ceremonially unclean because they, touch, they touched or came in contact uh, with a corpse. The difference being that uh, uh, with the red heifer sacrifice, they could continually use the ashes as they needed to uh, make the uh, drink. And so these distinctions highlight the red heifer's unique role in the Israelite purification rituals, separate from the communal and conventional functions of other sacrifices. And so the red heifer provided a means for handling ritual impurity due to death reflecting a profound understanding of purity, death, and the holiness required for the community living in close proximity to the divine presence. Remember I said before, all of this because God was among the people. It wasn't just a representative of God. It wasn't just an object that kind of represented God. The idea was that the spirit of God was present with them. And so these sacrifices and these ordinances uh, were given to the people to help them uh, deal 
uh, with the situation where they were in the presence of God, not only uh, you know, at a time of worship, but was in the presence of God at all times. Uh, today we'd say something like, wow, he's living in the church building. Well, we, we don't live in the church building today, uh, but the, their idea, their sense was they were always in the uh, presence, of, uh, presence of God. Now, ceremonial cleanliness was a crucial aspect of religious life in ancient Israel as outlined extensively throughout the Old Testament, particularly, particularly in the laws given in the books of Leviticus and Numbers. And we've talked about that in the last several uh, lessons. The importance of maintaining ritual purity was multifaceted, reflecting theological, practical, and symbolic dimensions. So here are the key reasons why ceremonial cleanliness was so important. First of all, there is a theological significance. The first of which is the holiness of God. The concept of ceremonial cleanliness was fundamentally linked to the holiness of God. The Israelites were called to be holy. Why? Because their God is holy. The purity laws were a means of preparing the people to approach God, emphasizing the vast difference between God's pure nature and of course, human impurity. Also the tabernacle and then later the temple was considered the dwelling place of God's presence among his people. Maintaining purity was essential for protecting the sanctity of this space and ensuring that God's presence remained uh, with the community. Also, community cohesion. Ceremonial cleanliness helped establish and maintain a well-ordered society. By adhering to these laws, the Israelites reinforced their identity as a community that was set apart for God. This practice fostered a sense of shared commitment and collective responsibility toward living according to divine laws. Everybody was responsible to remain and maintain ceremonial uh, purity. And of course, moral discipline. The rigorous observance of cleanliness laws cultivated a culture of discipline and obedience among the Israelites, which extended to moral and ethical areas of life. This discipline was essential for maintaining a covenant of faithfulness to God. There's also the idea of health and well being. While the primary purpose of purity laws was not medical, many of the practices had a secondary health benefit. For example, the laws concerning food or skin diseases and bodily discharge uh, helped prevent the spread of diseases and promoted public health within the camp at a time when medical knowledge about these matters were, were not available. Also, there was a certain psychological assurance. Ritual purity provided a sense of spiritual and physical well-being. Cleanliness rituals could alleviate concerns about contamination and illness, which were significant in a time when understanding of disease was very, very limited. And then of course, there was symbolic representation. Ceremonial cleanliness rituals often symbolized the removal of sin and the restoration of a right relationship with God. The process for purification and atonement illustrated the spiritual realities of sin's defilement and the need for divine cleansing. And of course, the act of cleansing oneself before participating in worship or entering the sacred space of the tabernacle or the temple served as a physical expression of spiritual preparation. It was a tangible way of expressing reverence and readiness to engage with the divine for prayer and for uh, worship. And then one more for the purpose of education and remembrance. The daily and weekly practices associated with maintaining ritual purity served as a constant reminder of the Israelites' special relationship with God, their history, and their responsibilities under the covenant. This, this ongoing aspect of education helped ingrain religious principles into every aspect of daily life. And so ceremonial cleanliness was thus not only about maintaining external purity, 
but was deeply intertwined with spiritual, ethical, and community life, reflecting and reinforcing the core values and the beliefs of the Israelite uh, community. And then finally, we arrive at chapter 20, chapter 20, verses one to 29. Chapter 20 of the book of Numbers serves as a significant breakpoint in the narrative of the Israelites' wilderness wanderings for several reasons. This chapter marks a crucial transition and provides events that fundamentally affect the leadership and the future direction of the Israelites as they continue towards the uh, promised land. Here's how it serves as a breakpoint. First, there's the death of Miriam and Aaron. The chapter begins with the death of Miriam at Kadesh uh, in chapter 20, verse one. Her death marks the loss of a key leader as Moses' sister and prophetess. Her presence was significant for the Israelite community. Later in the same chapter, Aaron dies on Mount Hor. Aaron's death is particularly impactful because he was the high priest and he had played a central role in religious and civil leadership. And so the passing of Aaron signifies a major transition in the priesthood itself with his son Eleazar taking over uh, his uh, duties. Next uh, is the incident at Meribah. Here, uh, one of the most critical events in this chapter is when Moses uh, strikes the rock at Meribah in order to bring forth water instead of speaking to the rock as God had commanded him in Numbers uh, 20 verses seven to 12. Because of this act of disobedience, God tells Moses that he will not lead the people into the promised land. This decree marks a dramatic shift in the leadership narrative, setting the stage for Joshua to eventually take over as the leader of the Jewish people. Then there's a shift in generation. The events in chapter 20 occur in the 40th year of the Israelite uh, wandering, indicating that the wandering period decreed by God is nearing its end. The deaths of Miriam and Aaron, along with the impending death of Moses, symbolized the passing away of the older generation that had left Egypt. Then there's the rejection at Edom. Uh, Moses sends messengers to the king of Edom requesting passage through his territory, promising to stay on the main road and pay for any water consumed. The king of Edom refuses and even threatens force if the Israelites try to pass. This rejection forces the Israelites to take a much longer route around Edom, delaying their journey uh, to Caden. And then there's the strategic realignment and challenges that take place. The chapter concludes with the Israelites at Mount Hor on the border of Edom, preparing for the final stages of their journey. The focus begins to shift towards conquering the land and dealing with external enemies, such as the Canaanites who, uh, whom they fight in chapter, uh, chapter 21. And so chapter 20 acts as a, uh, a turning point, if you will, in the wilderness narrative, marking the transition from the old leadership to new signaling the end of an era of wandering and setting the stage for the conquest of Canaan. It highlights themes of judgment, transition, and the inevitability of change, critical for the continuation of Israel's covenant journey. And so we finish uh, chapter 20 and uh, this whole section uh, as we do in um, uh, our lessons with uh, a couple of lessons for us today, what can we, what can we draw? Many, many, many lessons can be drawn uh, from these, but I've chosen, uh, I've chosen only two, two lessons. Uh, lesson number one, the importance of faithful leadership and accountability. We cannot underestimate how important leadership, faithful leadership and accountability, how important that is uh, in the church. Chapters 12 to 20 feature pivotal moments concerning the leadership of Moses, Aaron, and Miriam. In chapter 12, Miriam and Aaron challenge Moses' unique role as God's leader, which results in Miriam's temporary punishment with leprosy and, and a reinforcement of Moses' God-given authority. 
In chapter 20, Moses himself disobeys God's command at Mirabah by striking the rock to produce water instead of speaking to it, leading to God's judgment that he will not enter the promised land. So what, what's the lesson for today's believer? Well, these narratives underscore the critical importance of humility, obedience, and accountability in leadership roles within the church. Leaders are held to high standards because their actions and attitudes significantly influence others. Moreover, these passages remind believers that all authority comes from God and challenging this authority without just cause or disobeying God's direct commands can have severe consequences. Even Moses was disciplined by God for his disobedience. This teaches believers to seek God's guidance in their actions and to maintain a humble and obedient heart, especially those who are in leadership positions. All right, that's lesson number one. Lesson number two, unity in the church is vital. Throughout Numbers 16 and 17, the community faces division and rebellion, notably with Korah's challenge to Moses and Aaron's uh, leadership. This dissent leads to severe repercussions, not only for the rebels, but for the entire community, which suffers from a plague as a consequence of the, uh, you know, the associated turmoil. So what's the lesson for today's believer? Well, these chapters highlight the importance of unity and the dangers of discord within the church. For believers today, this underscores the need for maintaining peace and harmony within the church and among fellow believers. Disputes and divisions can weaken the church's mission and effectiveness and can lead to spiritual decay. The resolution of conflicts and the fostering of a spirit of cooperation and unity are essential in reflecting Christ's love to a lost world that is already skeptical about organized religion. We don't need to give the world another reason to distrust the church. If they can see unity here and forgiveness and, 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 uh, and uh, discipline, uh, they will have uh, uh, many more reasons to trust us when we proclaim the gospel uh, to them. All right, well, that's a rather long lesson on these, uh, on these chapters. Here's the assignment for next week. If you're still, if you're still with me here, uh, I want you to reread chapters 13 to 20. Again, reinforce all the information uh, that this uh, section uh, has given you and this lesson has provided, and then read chapters 21 to 27 uh, uh, in preparation for our next class. Well, that's it for today. I thank you for your attention. I pray that God blesses you and hope to see you next time.